Hello everyone, the Telegraph Rugby Podcast is back ahead of the Six Nations and I don't think we have missed too many big moments. Only Eddie Jones returning to Australia to coach the Wallabies on a mission to destroy England's Rugby World Cup hopes following its sacking. And a new tackle law introduced by the RFU causing chaos across the community game. Apart from that, everything seems peachy. Joining myself, the Telegraph's rugby reporter Ben Coles, as ever, our senior rugby writer Charlie Morgan. Hey, you Morgs. Hi, Colesy. And the rugby reporter with the busiest passport in the game, Charles Richardson. Bonjour, Charles. Bonjour. And yes, on that theme, I'm going to kick us off. If anybody else listening to this podcast is going to every Six Nations ground during the upcoming championship, then please email me because I am, and we could do a little. We can you know, we become buddies. Please buy Charles a beer, I think is what he's saying politely. And that. <laughs> Guys, let's get straight into it. The Six Nations is nearly upon us. It starts this week, and it's the first Six Nations campaign for Steve Borthwick as England's head coach. Charlie, what can we expect from Borthwick as head coach? Well, what did what were England missing over the last kind of, over the end days of the tenure of Eddie Jones? It was clarity. So we get C words and we get F words in, in Steve Borthwick's press conferences all the time. Clarity, fight. Those are the kind of base, the base requirements, um, the non-negotiables. Um, I think what that means is um, is that tactically they'll kick a lot more. There'll be a lot more kick pressure. In England, we're trying to move away from that. If we remember at the end of um, Eddie Jones' tenure and wanting to kind of move the ball a bit more, as it cu- as kind of came to fruition when they had to uh, again down to fourteen against New Zealand. Um, I think so slightly back to basics in in that regard but that doesn't I don't necessarily see that as a retrograde step because I feel that this group of players needed that um and having kind of me and Charles potentially be slightly biased in in this regard because we covered Leicester so closely on their um on their way to the to the uh, premiership title last season um but I just think that a, a coach needs is always aiming to get the the uh, aside to be um, the sum of their parts. Um, England weren't that. They were nowhere near that at the end of Jones's tenure. They'll get closer to that under Borthwick. He has he is talking about making sure that teams, that players, sorry, get their super strengths out on the field, and that's exactly what that's exactly what he'll be aiming to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> you've touched on it already, Charlie, but. Just chatting to Dan Cole and Dan Kelly a couple of weeks ago. Again, I know they're both with Leicester, but they've had as as good a sort of um, front seat view of, of of Steve Borthwick's coaching as anyone. Dan Cole, the weekend before he got called up for England, he was he was saying how um, he'd been sort of Steve had told him that if you're incredible at the set piece, if you're incredible in the tackle, if you're incredible at the rook, and if you're incredible on the kick chase, then we can forgive a, a, a sort of lack of ball carrying creativity and explosivity, if you will, because he will pick people in other positions who can mitigate for that. And it's just, and, and touching on what you said, Charlie, you know, Dan Kelly, the phrase that he kept on trotting out, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be Fascinating to see how England use him because obviously there's a chance that he might be the sort of fulcrum of of England's defensive strategy. And the phrase that he kept on trotting out, which which Charlie has already touched on at Leicester, was that their mantra was that the fight is non negotiable. That was their that was their mantra, and that's what Borthwick did when he came in when he when he inherited a group of players who weren't his. Um, who were massively underperforming at Leicester. You know, there are similarities and parallels to England uh, and he reinstilled a lot of fight and that's the foundations. That's what it was all built on and that's what probably what we're going to see in the Six Nations, even if there are a couple of losses along the way, that it'll be a team who is willing to scrap. So Cole is a brilliant one to to start on if we're talking about how England are going to play because he, where he lacks is probably pace. Well, certainly pace. We heard whispers before um, Laws was ruled out that he was going to be um, considered as a second row to kind of make up for that pace. Billy Winipola has been dropped, probably met, perhaps to make up for that lack of pace that a pack might have with Dan Cole in it. So this is what we're, what we're talking about with Steve Borthwick: very pragmatic decisions to make up, um, to make up kind of for, well, just to ensure that his player strengths can be put across as best as best they can. Really encouraging. He spoke about making mistakes, which I think is something that, um, if you allow me to expand on that point, because it doesn't sound very good to start with, but 
as far as as far as trying things a little bit more as well so being pragmatic but also pushing the envelope a little bit i think it will be slightly conservative certainly for these first two games because they've had such a short time together um and there's a really good uh question who's been tweeted in by brett Igo. um you'll probably know about this a lot better than me but there are a lot of new coaches in the, in the six nations um after coaching changes in england wales scotland um high profile ones and I think Sean Edwards said, didn't he, whether he said it on the pod or not, I can't remember, but he said what he loves is the first week of the Six Nations because every side has a fortnight to build up to it. And it's about how quickly those coaching changes can be implemented. But I think England have got, they can, they can, there are a lot of easy wins there. And I think Borthwick is clever enough to kind of spot those easy wins. We'll, we'll dive a lot deeper into the Cap Cuts Cup in a bit and, and everything ahead. But we're also going to hear in this episode from Finn Russell and Charles, you had a chat with uh, recently in, in recent weeks about what's to come for Scotland. Uh, let's just touch on Scotland quickly. What what do we sort of expect from Scotland? I'm I'm still reeling from the disappointment of last year where they they had that winner bring it to start and then they went to Cardiff against Wales and they were they were rubbish to put it yeah, well, frankly. I, what 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 do we expect? Well, I spoke about this with Finn in, in Paris actually about how they've struggled historically to to, to back up those big wins. You know that they, they have had big wins. Uh, you will look even in Argentina. You know they they had a, they had a big win out there as well that they didn't back up. Um, and 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 Gregor Townsend spoke about that at the Six Nations launch, whereby he said that it is an area that needs to be addressed, and they are working with psychologists and in terms of the application to make sure that 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 a, that one swallow doesn't make that doesn't make the spring. You know, and um, for them in the Six Nations, but I mean, it's a tricky one for them because. There are, there, there are, the standard is going to be so high this year. France and Ireland, um, you, you've got to be saying that, that Scotland will, will lose to both of those two. And at, winning at Twickenham is is, is not easy. And they've, they've only done it once in God however many years. Um, so then if you're looking at three losses already, then they've got to be targeting, targeting that Wales game at Murrayfield as, as an absolute must win um, in order to sort of avoid wooden spoon contention, really. Yeah, it's certainly true. I, I think if we talk about the other end of the table and the favourites, Ireland currently with the bookies are the favourites, and that seems to be Charlie just because of that, the way the schedule plays out and the fact that they're France at home. Already, so, I mean, we'll be talking about that game in the week before, and I'm already so excited to see how that plays out. Do, do you think Ireland's sort of status as favourites, that seems warranted, does it? Yeah, um, I think that we always talk about cohesion with Ireland, don't we, in that? Lens have just looked irresistible in the Champions Cup and now will basically be transplanting that team into the national setup again. I think their autumn was pretty scruffy, wasn't it? But one thing that they did do was resist South Africa in the, the scrummage in the mall quite well. And I think that was huge as far as if you think Leinster and Ireland, where is their Achilles heel been in the past? It's been there, it's been on the set, it's been being squeezed at the set piece or on the game line. And God, we spoke about it at the time, didn't we? But that South Africa Ireland game that was that was eye watering. That that mm. game line battle and Ireland came through it. I think that bodes really well. So I think they do get past for and 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 as you as you mentioned, Ben, the home home advantage is such a such a kind of key thing when you're weighing up how sides are going to go. So yeah, I have them. I have I have them as as favourites. I think maybe they might get a slam. I th- think though that. Getting a slam is just so difficult. So, so difficult. Mm. Not to pull back the curtain too much, but it's almost like the easiest way to pick your Six Nations winner is that you just look at who the top two teams are probably are going to the tournament and you see who is at home in that fixture and you think, oh yeah, it's Ireland. Just like last year, we were saying, this is the year that France are finally going to win a Grand mm. Slam because they've got Ireland at home and Ireland are the strongest opponent and that's sort of the way, the way it works. Uh, Charles, just on a different note, with Wales... And Warren Gatland talking about Ireland and, and winning the title and potentially and potentially winning a slam. That that first game between Wales and Ireland is suddenly so like twenty times more interesting, isn't it? Because Gatland is coaching Wales and Gatland's history with Ireland. Do you think actually that is a bit of a banana skin for Andy Farrell and his team? Potentially, but of all the teams that you'd probably want to face first up, potentially other than Italy, Wales might be quite high up in the list in terms of Ireland's fixtures. They wouldn't have wanted France first. They wouldn't have wanted Steve Borthwick and Kevin Sinfield's rejuvenated England first. 
I'm not convinced they'd have wanted to go to Murrayfield first either, with Finn Russell coming back into form. So you're looking at a Wales team, yes, who have brought in Warren Gatlin, but who are, go- are coming into this um, are coming into this Six Nations on the back of losses to Georgia and Australia and a complete capitulation against the Wallabies. You know, so confidence. Confidence will have increased with the with the return of Warren Gatlin, somebody who has brought great success to them. But I don't know if he's if he's got the time um, to sort of skyrocket that confidence enough whereby they're going to be a force in this year's championship. Perhaps by the World Cup, who knows? I mean, they've got to go to Rome, and it, it, that's going to be a really tough day for them. You know, obviously they lost last year in Cardiff, um, and it, I mean, a, a betting man would say that Wales will triumph in Rome, but. We wouldn't be sitting here surprised if Italy won that, I don't think. No, that's very true. That's very true. Well, listen, let's move on and chat about the Cowfords Cup this Saturday. England against Scotland. Fascinating for even more readers because Steve Walker is in charge. Let's see what we're going to get. First, we're going to start with an interview which Charles did with Finn Russell over in Paris where he talks about everything ahead of the Six Nations and what Scotland can expect to deliver over the coming weeks. What kind of England are you, are you expecting now with, with Eddie gone and, and Steve in and maybe Marcus at 10, maybe Farrell at yeah, 10? I mean, um, does, does it make it very difficult to sort of plan and, and, and prepare considering the difference in those two? Yeah, I mean, Marcus, he just came back after his injury. I mean, the weekend there, he was obviously really good against us, like created a couple of X-Factor tries. Um, I, I, I have no clue what England, what England are gonna are gonna do against us. I've not seen Leicester play enough the last year. I think that would be our probably best, or our best way to look at them. It would be their their defend Leicester's defensive systems, Leicester's attacking systems, etc. Because you know the coaching staff have come from there, so yeah. the individuals will change, the players will change. But I can't see a coach coming into a national team and com- you know completely changing how he's been coaching. Yeah. So I think we're going to have to watch Leicester and see what they've what they've been up to in terms of the systems and what they've put in place. Um, with Marx and Faz, I don't know what they'll do. Um, obviously, they went with Marx and Faz at 10 12 in the last Six Nations and then November there. So whether or not they do that or not, I'm not sure. Uh, again, I don't, I don't know enough about. The, um, what would you what would you prefer to face? Would you do you enjoy do you like facing a sort of first five eighth, second five eighth, or do you prefer? Um, Facing a, a ten and a sort of more ball carrying, ball carrying twelve. I think with England they can, they've got such a, a strong pool of players that can do whatever they fancy. Yeah. Like if they do, you know, Marx and Faz at ten, twelve, then they can then obviously put a two Lange in there to to have that ball carrying with Faz being a ball player, or however they want, or they could do Marcus or Faz at ten, put two Lange in at twelve, or put someone like that in at twelve, with then you know Marshall and a Slade at thirteen who's. Yeah. I'm more kind of typical 13 with the kind of outside breaks looking yeah. for the offloads the kicking game um, it depends uh, it's hard to say <laughs> how, it depends how they're going to play and what they're going to do and who they have in the back three will then change who they maybe want to put in at 10, 12, 13 I think that they'll go either with Marcus, Marcus or Faz at 10 I don't think they'll go with the Marcus and Faz 10, 12 combination you don't? personally I don't think that no. I think they'll go with one other I, I, well, Farrell's been named as captain. Well, I can see him starting at ten. Well, to be fair, Faz has been playing class this year as well. Yeah. Like, he's, I think you know he is a world class player. You know. Yeah. I can see them. Marx hasn't played since November. Like, like we saw at the weekend there. Marx has probably got that X factor as we all know. If yeah. The game isn't going as planned. He can come on and completely change it. You yeah. know. Um, so I, that, that that's how I can see them going with. I, I don't know. I, I've not seen the squad. I could see them going with Faz at ten. Having a left foot nowadays is quite important mm. for the different kicking options. Um, Have you got yeah, one with Scotland? I like Price at nine, but Ali Price, yeah. I don't think in the back. Not, Ollie Smith, Ollie he Smith. would be one, but it depends. It depends who you pick. Yeah. We've not really got an out and out left foot. I think nowadays it changes. It helps a lot. This is probably a bit rude, really, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I think the perception in England is that. The Calcutta Cup is the Six Nations for Scotland. It seems like a lot of the time when you win the Calcutta Cup, you then drop off quite significantly in the rest of the tournament. Is that fair, or is that, um, or is that has that been identified and consciously um, sort of breached? 
I think in the past year, like, Cup was a massive game for us. It still is a massive game for us. Mm-hmm. But we, need to, like you're saying, we need to focus on the tournament, not just one game. Yeah. Um, I think something, you know, just from my experiences when I've been playing, if we've had a big win for Scotland, whether it be against England, France, Wales, Ireland, whoever, Italy, we sometimes struggle the week after that, or which I think is something that we need to get better at. You know, if we manage to go down to Twickenham and beat them there. It's then right. We've done one, like we've done one of the five games, but mm. we need to then get up and win the next game. We always seem to struggle that second game after a big one. Um, Why is that? I don't know. Um, I don't know if it's because in in Scotland, it's like you get, like you say, you get one big win. It's like oh, they're they're doing really well. It's <coughs> going to be a different tournament. It's this. It's I, I don't I don't know if it's everything that goes around it or or what it is as players. Hope hope. What mentally changes for us? I'd, 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 if I knew what it was, I'd be, I'd be an amazing yeah. head coach, you know. But yeah. um, whenever we've had these good wins, we always say the right things throughout the week. We always train the way we want to train, and then we never seem not never, but we don't often back it up. Yeah. Um, occasionally we do, but it's something that is, as Scotland's a, a nation, as a you know. So as a rugby team, as a rugby nation, we need to we need to get better at. Um, and on that theme, on the importance of the Calcutta Cup and the sort of um, extra emphasis on playing England and beating England and the old enemy and stuff, Jim Telford saying that you should get rid of Flower of Scotland as the as the anthem. Why? Uh, to anti English sentiment and and this is that is that <laughs> yeah. Why is that? That's obviously not something that you would uh, necessarily agree with or have given any thought to by the sounds of things. Yeah, it's about, well, when you think of the lyrics, it's obviously about us. Do you, you like know, it? I like the anthem. Everyone yeah. you speak to says that they love the anthem, you know. Yeah. Um, well, even if it is anti-English, why does it matter? It's just the... Uh, yeah, I don't think any English person is necessarily... Uh, I don't know what other song we're going to... What, what else we're going to say? Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, uh, originally it was yeah. God Save the Queen, I think. What, yeah, what but came. I mean, that's like a British song, you know? Yeah, it is, yeah. And yeah, of course, we're part of the UK, but for our own nation, for Scotland, like, why would we sing a, a British song when it's, we're singing it for our country? Yeah. No, I, I, I know, I agree. I'd, I don't understand why he said that, to be honest. I don't know. I don't know Jim Telford. I, I've maybe met him a couple of times, but I don't know him at all, but I wouldn't understand why he said that. The age of the fly half in the Northern Hemisphere, I, I can't remember another time in, in history, and but you might set me right, but... Be surprised if you could <laughs> yeah, to think wonder why. that the northern hemisphere had so many good fly halves that, in comparison with the southern hemisphere, are, are much better. I would say. I mean, there's Richie Mwanga in New Zealand. Yeah. Australia have gone back to Bernard Foley and Quade Cooper, who are obviously excellent players, but are getting on a bit. Argentina are playing a, a winger at fly half. South Africa can't find one when Pollard's injured, and then you've got yourself. I mean, you've got two slash three very good fly halves for Scotland you've got Ford Farrell Marcus, um, Marcus Jalibert and Tamak mm-hmm. and all of the other guys Carbonell Bello all the other guys in France uh, obviously Sexton uh, Bigger those sort of guys yeah. and I just wondered why it, I mean it might just be a complete fluke but where has it come from and, and what's your your take on it really yeah there is obviously world class tens in Europe just now um, I think in South Africa, obviously, like you see, you've got Pollard and there's uh, Willemse. Willemse, but he means a fullback and they sort of have yeah. a stopgap turn, aren't they? I think, yeah. In England, like, maybe it's just a time that we're, we're lucky to have good tens going around. But even then, if you think, what's that, there's maybe 10 top tens in Europe, I mean, mm. is that right? 10, Probably. 12, yeah, yeah. around about that kind of top level international tens who are going around just now. Which is a lot of tens, but when you think about the amount of teams that are there, there's probably 30 teams. Mm-hmm. I mean, you mentioned Henry Slade a lot there. Are you, are you a fan? Obviously, you wouldn't. You yeah, I think, I think personally, I think he's a class player. Right. I think he's really good. Um, for me, you know, I think England, Ireland, they threw a class pass, like right to left, to, to Johnny May. I think yeah. they scored off the back of it. Yeah. So I think the skill set he's got, I, I'm a fan, like, I think the, the skill set he's got, as well as his kicking game, is really good. Um, uh, yeah, I think he's. I, I don't know how he's, he doesn't play. Him. I think I, I think he should play more for England than he has done. That was Tim Russell chatting to Charles. Charles, how did you sort of find that interview and, and speaking to him in Paris? He, he's such an engaging character and, and one that fans absolutely love to watch, isn't he? Yeah, he was great. He, he it's the first time I'd interviewed him 
uh, one on one, and he was brilliant. He's matured. I think those days of um, being caught in in Edinburgh pubs and bars potentially are long gone, and and, and bust ups with with the coaching staff are, are long gone. But he, but he kept that cheekiness to him at the same time. That was he was cracking jokes about about Netflix and um, and about his relationship with Gregor. Um, but he seemed yeah. to have the bit between his teeth. Uh, he, he seemed to have the bit between his teeth um, with regard to. Uh, his move to Bath, of course, and his final season in Paris and the Six Nations and the World Cup coming up, where presumably he will now be the starting scrum half for Scotland um, with Blair Kinghorn now playing second fiddle. But we don't know that for certain, but I think most of us would bet on that happening. He's not switched to scrum half, is he? You mean, you mean fly half? Did then? I say scrum half? <laughs> you, I mean fly half. I do mean fly half. Because yeah. that would be that would be world exclusive. Yeah, could, you, <laughs> just slip that in at the end. Oh, by the way, he's moving positions to, to scrum half. <laughs> My relationship with Greg Townsend is great because he's moving me to scrum half. I, I think that would be. <laughs> I think, I think that would be absolutely brilliant. And it's, I think it's really interesting that he sort of spoke about how they need to take that Calcutta to cup mindset. And, and really work on replicating it and doing that with psychologists and and, and trying to crack the mental aspect of it. Always because, I know, I know the Calcutta Cup is a massive deal, but you look at what Scotland have done in the Calcutta Cup over the last few years and you sort of think, you, you've won this enough times now where you would hope that that wouldn't be your, your benchmark anymore. And uh, are we? Is it time that we maybe got a bit greedy and started expecting a bit more from Scotland? I felt like it is. I th- I, they've, they've, they've lost one in the last five, haven't they, against England? And it hasn't been, you know, it hasn't been a, a case of them playing on emotion and riding that emotion to wins. It's, they've been technically better than England. They've set up, they've, they've, they've achieved parity and more at set piece, although England's more probably got on top of them at Murrayfield last time. They've been reared, their fast paced phase play has been excellent, which is helped by the fact that Russell has had two or three absolute stormers. Um, and they've gone really hard at the breakdown, which is traditionally or kind of typically where in, where England have struggled. And all of that has has kind of manifested itself in, into a really kind of awkward matchup for England. Um, and what you get, and I think maybe what the Six Nations or maybe underline, is that different teams match up match up well with other teams, and and because of how close the landscape is. Um, then sides might might get a series of wins over the others because they because they kind of um, because they've got the wood on them because just because their styles match up well, um, but I still I still agree. So I think it's a case of maybe Scotland rousing themselves for England, but also matching up well to England's um, their strengths matching up well to England's. Um, however, it's certainly not greedy to expect them to kind of translate that. Well, while we're on Scotland, just a few quick talking points that I think are worth touching on. So. No, Darcy Graham. That's really sad because he's just brilliant, isn't he? He's just such a such a fascinating player to watch. I think that is a shame. But Rory McConaughey comes into the squad, the bath wing game, play, last played for England at the Rugby World Cup in 2019, and he's now switched. Can we potentially see him involved? He's he's one of two really interesting call ups, isn't he? Along with Ben Healy, the Munster fly half, who is, I mean, he's third choice of Munster, sure, but but behind a couple of really good players there. But he's been called up with Adam Hastings injured. What do we make of those two selections? Um, really interesting. I mean, Rory McConaughey. Yeah, it's, it's, he's going to he's he's blazing a trail, really, isn't he? Uh, going to be you know, there's probably more players who are going to follow him, having played for one one country and um, and then switching to another. But I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if he'll. I mean, he's never he's never really set the world alight at Bath. Uh, I've I've never I've never thought. I mean, he's a good solid winger. Is he someone who's going to be really thrusting Scotland into world class territory? I'm I'm not 100 percent sure. Obviously, Duhan van der Merwe is genuinely an excellent winger, and it is such a shame that Darcy Graham is missing because in van der Merwe and Darcy Graham they have a a brilliant balance to those two wings and two excellent wings. I mean, this is the age old thing with Scotland, really, and you've touched on it already, Cosy, is that it is, it's, they struggle for depth. They lack depth. I think they're starting 15. If when everyone's fit, c- could trouble most countries of the world. Um, but once you get beneath that, once you start chipping away at that, um, they struggle a little bit more. I think there's lots to talk about with the England selection, so I think let's dive let's dive into that. So if we do a, re- a quick recap of the injuries, so not available for this Scotland game, no Courtney Laws, no Henry Slade. Is that right? That's right. 
That's right. That's yep. right. Um, no, no, hip no injury. Slade. No Slade, no Elliot Daly, no Jamie George, and no Luke Cowan Dickey. So, so there's pretty significant injuries there, like players who feature prominently under Eddie Jones. In, in terms of maybe let's just go through some of the areas involved there, and let's start with the topic which we've probably spent more airtime on on this podcast than anything else. Who are England going to pick in midfield? <laughs> um, Charles, do you want to start with that? A, a prediction or my opinion? Uh, but I'll, I'll take I'll take both. Okay, um, I I if I was Steve Borthwick, I think I'd I'd slip Owen Farrell back to ten, and I'd have Marcus Smith coming off the bench um, to to win the game if needed uh, around the sixty fifth seventieth minute. Charlie, what about you? What are you expecting? I would not be surprised at all if um, Borthwick uh, continues. I could almost hear sort of. Re, uh, listeners, sorry, kind of growling before I say this, but my understanding mm. is that um, Farrell and Smith have trained quite a lot together, um, so I wouldn't be surprised to to see that. Um, Joe March is an interesting one, really, really, really sharp in 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 patches. That last season's uh, Six Nations, England's probably England's best player in Paris. Yeah, um, yeah and at Ireland at home, he was outstanding as well. And then jettisoned um, on the back of the first test in Australia, and quite a confusing one at that. Um, he has the Nick Evans kind of connection there too. I'm just listing names here. I've no, I, to be honest, I've no idea what they're going to do. Too, Manny Too Lucky has looked a lot more comfortable for sale at twelve. Um, but I think the fact that, and if we, we've done a piece today on how Freddie Stewart gets used because he's not the classical playmaking fullback, which kind of makes you need two playmakers. And where those playmakers come, is it, is it Smith and Farrell? Is it um, one of the wings stepping up, Max Malins, that could potentially be good news for Max Malins. It's um, it's it's such a tricky one because, but what what but what we know is that Borthwick will be absolutely determined to get um to make this backline work in theory and make sure there's a fluidity there. And I think actually we're talking about um easy wins to be made early. Um, I think Nick Evans can make a quick difference to him. That's that kind of sliding phase play that England were re- England really stuttered and struggled with mm. over the autumn um, and I think I think but that selection has to be spot on so on the back three then if 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 for instance if for the sake of argument he is pick he picks Ollie Hassel Collins on the left wing who we know he rates and maybe Anthony Watson returns who's in excellent form for Leicester and who we know he rates very highly and who was called up for Henry Slade does that mean, therefore, that we're going to see Smith and Farrell at ten and twelve? I would. Because I would you have don't so. have a playmaker in that back three, do you? That's the that's the that's the balance I'm talking about. Um, yeah, and then that's why actually I think I wonder whether part of the reason that Jones persisted with Farrell and Smith for so long was that somebody like Freddie Stewart was bedding in that is that Stewart's and I talk about this in the piece that's online at the minute, but that his his aerial dominance is that absolute super strength that probably the most prominent super strength that you can think of across the whole England squad is that is mm. Freddie Stewart's aerial dominance but as I say not a not a classical playmaker like Billy LaRue like um, Hugh, Hugo Keenan or like uh, Alex Goode for example so you're making up your playmaking elsewhere um, and I think that um, as I say Mac, Max Mayer is, is a good example of that but if you want to go Hassel Collins and Watson I was at Leicester Saints on, on Saturday and Watson was excellent just ooze class excellent under the high ball um one back four box kicks um england uh, sorry um leicester didn't use him very well in face play but when he did touch the ball usually from kick returns electric i think he beat seven defenders um so i wouldn't be surprised to see him slot straight back in but yeah that does that does leave england needing um a way to move the ball to the edges and i think that could that could be the the smith farrell axis be really pleasing to see Hassel Collins involved because he was one of those one of those lads who would be pitching up to England training camps on Sunday under Eddie Jones and then heading home on Tuesday, wouldn't he? I think he must have done that about ten times along with as many others have done over there. The Radwan Brigade. It's really it's really interesting. <laughs> it's really interesting that and just to, to come potentially stand up for Jones a little bit. What is that Hassel Collins? Hassel Collins has definitely looked sharper in defence and definitely oh, looked sharper sure, under the yeah. high ball and has definitely kind of added a bit of a kicking game to what we kind of knew that he already has and that said and what the, the potential spur of that is a little bit of time around 
around Eddie Jones. And we know we know sort of one thing that we keep hearing is that the coaching wasn't good enough under Jones. And I think that has kind of been reflected in the way that Steve Borthwick has cleaned house and made sure that Cockwell's been across to give him to give to his focus on the scrum and we've had Nick Owens come in. Um but I think but I think we can credit Jones a little bit for pushing Hassel Collins in the right direction. And we might see we might see other players develop um is it sort of as a legacy of Jones. I would completely concur with that. I've not watched um, Hassel Collins any more this season than I did last season. You know, we watched in this job, we watched them all a lot. Um, and I didn't, I wouldn't have had him in my England team last season. And this season, I think there has been a noticeable improvement. And I think I would have him in if I was if I was picking the England team. I think he is in the top two wingers in, in the country um, this season. And I don't think he was there last season. I don't think he was as much of an all-round package as he is this season. Without having, you know, something absolute superstar about him, um, yeah. it, it's that combination, isn't it? Like you said, of, of improving the areas where he was lacking, but also if England can now capitalise on the strengths that he offers, those those strengths they're, they're there in abundance with the, his ability to beat defenders, given his frame, given, given how they mm. can use him as an option coming off the wing in midfield, sort of how they've tried to do. And or sort of how in charge of the under Jones with Jacob and seeing a lot, but sort of gave up with it because they didn't really persist with it. I keep thinking again about that try against was it Argentina in the autumn where they used Copper and Seager off his wing to set up a try. They can use Hassel Collins in a similar fashion, except he's also got, got blistering pace to, to make breaks. I, I think he's a really interesting player. Well, while we're on the back three a little bit, does uh, a question from Molly Simpson on Twitter, does English rugby have some ridiculously fast outliers, Arundel, Radwan, May? I mean, the general supporting public perceives others as relatively slow, such as uh, Freddie Stewart, Cade and Murley, when they're actually perfectly fast enough to for, in, for an international back three. What do you reckon? That's a, good, that's a good question. I haven't thought about it that way that much. I think often with those really, really quick wingers, they, unless they're Johnny May, they don't tend to win that many caps I mean I'm thinking about Radwan and I know that I think at the way that Arundel comes back in during the Six Nations it's going to be interesting I know he had 20 minutes off the bench on Sunday against Harlequin yeah there might be a point to that that you sort of because you sort of compare players in a line almost next to each other you think that one is actually quite slow whereas actually they are fairly quick semi, semi agreeing with with Ollie there um you know, Jack Jack Noel I've always rated very highly and I know a lot of other people have as well and certainly Warren Gatland did to take him on the Lions tour and Eddie Jones picked him lots and lots for England but one of the criticisms that was always levelled at him was that he was too slow for for an international wing and I mean he's, he's, he's getting on a little bit now so that might be a very valid criticism now but I think I think in his pomp I think that was certainly unfair and I think that people were using that sort of as a bit of a straw man and ignoring the sort of the World class strengths that he brought elsewhere, um, which which is similar to, to 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 the other to the to the guys that Ollie mentioned in terms of Freddie Stewart and and Caden Murley. It, it it would be great to focus on as Steve Borthwick does what these guys are good at and what they can do rather than things that they can't. It, it just two more areas of selection to talk about before we do we make uh, before I make you both do a little prediction. Um, just to clarify what's going on at Hooker, so Jamie George is in the squad. He's going through return to play protocols. Jack Walker is uncapped and Tom Dunn are the other two. Are, are we expecting Jamie George to be available? I guess nobody really knows that answer because it all depends on how he goes through the protocol after his concussion against Edinburgh. But are we hopeful, at least, that he might play? And if not, Jack Walker would be a great choice, I think, actually, for a debut, given how well he's done at Quinn since leaving Bath. I remember... When he left Bath a couple of seasons ago, it was quite an interesting move, and he's, he's thrived at Harlequins. But what's the latest for Jamie George? Um, so he'll be back in training on either Thursday or Friday this week. Charlie, do you know for certain there was it was a little bit up in the air last week? It's obviously twelve days from last Sunday, but but there seems to be a little bit uncertain. That is, if if he passes all his graduated return to play protocols, the earliest he can return to training is either Thursday or full contact training is Thursday or Friday this week, which is obviously cutting it very fine for a match on the Saturday. But I'm guessing that doesn't preclude him from from line-out sessions and line-out drills and and throwing in, which is presumably where a lot of a hooker's uh, sort of ball training would would take place. Yeah, and obviously he'll be more, he'll be 
it'll be easier for him to slot back in given his experience than anybody else. I think he actually rejoined England, I think, last Thursday, didn't he, Charles? We were, to, we were told. Yeah. Um, so he's been around it for a while. And I think by this stage, we probably have an indication whether or not he was struggling. Um, Jamie Blamire has gone back to Newcastle this week. So um, they're clearly pretty confident there. Yeah, I agree, agree on Jack Walker, Colsey, age group prodigy, um, suffer with injuries. One question mark potentially would be Harlequin Zina hasn't been fantastic this this season or has no. kind of um, stuttered at um, inop- inopportune times. And Tom Dunn, what Steve Borthwick picked that is, that is that's all about tenacity, all about set piece um, solidity. Um, so he wouldn't let anyone down either. Kind of another kind of curious one. I wrote a piece on on England, the kind of lack of depth at Hooker that. Um, Eddie Jones has left behind and actually got quite a lot of responses saying, well, you know, are you not going to pick Dylan Hartley, Jamie George and um, Luke Kandicki if they're available? And that's fair enough. But I do, still do think that there were some curiosities like Jack Singleton coming on, going on the 2019 World Cup to come in the back row felt a bit odd. Um, and they maybe could have been developed a little bit and things like Alfie Barbary switching back to the back row don't help. But um, I think England are going to end up with Jamie George in that 23 to face Scotland and um, it'll be between one of um, Dunn and Walker and I don't think I think both both are sound enough sound enough choices I, I was going to say Dunn also selected for his excellent right. um, lid but he shaved the mullet off now I think so so sadly that's yeah. not there anymore Walker does have a squint throwing him as you said and, and hopefully Borthwick can iron that out um, Jamie George obviously we don't know whether he's going to be fit to play or not. We don't know if he's going to pass his return to play. All I would say is, is that I was there at that game uh, where Edim- where he was concussed, where Saracens lost in Edinburgh, and he should never, obviously, he should never have gone back onto the field in the first place after that very, very hefty collision with Luke Crosby. However, he did pass his HIA, which obviously bodes well for the for his recovery this week, and so therefore. I think I think it would be fair to say that there's probably optimism that he will be back in time for for Saturday, especially considering how involved he's been over the past week. In just a final selection area before we go into that prediction, uh, back row. What are we sort of expecting with Courtney Law's not there? That I feel like there's a lot of options and not necessarily a lot of clear answers. And I say that having watched the London Irish game with the Celtic yesterday and thinking Tom Pearson was brilliant again, and he's, and he's not actually in the squad. So, in terms of who you think might feature there, there's a lot of options. Who would you want to go for? Gee, it's difficult, isn't it? I think, I think for yeah. me, the absence of Courtney Laws, Lewis Ludham's always somebody that tends to get kind of overlooked in the in this kind of shakeup, and he's been he was outstanding at Murrayfield a year ago at six um, in Laws' absence, and so that says to me he can actually pick if he wants to. If he wants to go with a similar template to the one that was pretty good against Scotland last time, he can go with Ludlam, Ben Curry, Sam Simmons. Um, Ollie Chesson would be the other guy that would naturally make up that line-out, that line-out presence at six in, in Law's absence. So that's an option there. I watched, um, sort of caught up a little bit with Jack Willis against Munster and he just, in what was a really pretty ferocious, um, you know, all-in all in Champions Cup game, his physicality looked pretty comfortable, so I think I'd really I quite like to see him get a kind of extended run at in in Test rugby to see if he can if he can cope there. But equally, I think Ben up Ben up, and and you've got Don Brandt you've got Don Brandt um, suiting the Evans way like Marchant as we spoke about before and Murley. Um, but I think if if Steve Borthwick is really going to um, put his money where his mouth is as far as um, the Premiership. And trusting players that go well there, then Ben Al, I think I'd quite like to see him in, in the 20 jersey. Um, just to wrap up then, gents, uh, let's have your predictions. Who wins on Saturday? I'm leaning towards. Oh, it's quite a lot to ask of England to win this, given it's Ballfield's first game in limited preparation. I just wonder if, um, sort of, they might sneak it. I don't know why, pure gut feeling. Charles, what about you? England by five. Well, it. Nice. Yeah. I was thinking by three, but um, that that suggests uncertainty. But I think I think gut says England sneak it and a very important win to get a bit of momentum. 
Okay, kicking off the 2023 Six Nations is a, a really juicy game, actually, in Cardiff between Wales and Ireland. Warren Gatlin up against Andy Farrell, lots of subplots. But what do we sort of expect from Wales, do we think, given that Gatlin has had sort of limited time to, to get his hands on this squad? Charlie, you go first. What are you expecting? Oh, defiance, I think. we do One thing we can, we can count on Wales to kind of produce a back-to-the-wall performance when there's turmoil around them and the WIU uh situation would probably uh class of t- turmoil wouldn't it nigel walker described it as an existential crisis within the game gatlin really interesting that the six nations launched um andy farrell was kind of asked about andy farrell was he was enjoying himself at that launch wasn't oh he? yeah and he big time yeah <laughs> and he he yep. got asked about warren gatlin's kind of propensity to galvanize a side in adversity and he were he just grinned and he said look warren will love this brief Warren will love this fortnight leading up, um, leading up to the game. So I think they, I think they bring Ireland into a scrap. I think they flood the breakdown. We will speak about Jack Morgan and how kind of um, how dogged he is. I think their set piece will go all right because it will have a strong Ospreys accent. So then Maul could potentially hurt um, hurt Ireland a little bit. And the scrum is obviously fascinating as ever. Um, so that's how they potentially drag them into a fight. Damn bigger epitomizes the the ability to do that it's just whether Ireland will be able to break them down with that phase play and I have to say I think they will be able to do that um, often enough to win yeah I think Ireland have always been up for the scrap haven't they certainly in the but but then maybe pre Joe Schmidt they didn't really have the class to get out of it at times uh, whereas in the in the post Joe Schmidt with Andy Farrell in, in this in this new era of Irish rugby, I think they've they, they'll be up for the scrap, but they'll also have the class to get out of it and and, and get beyond Wales. I think and get and get up and running. I, I, Wales Wales won't lie down. No, not a chance. Not with not with Gatlin back and not with the the turmoil and with a, with a slight improvement. Well, no, a, a, a large improvement really among the regions. You'd have to say over the past few months, especially the Ospreys, who have been going great guns in Europe uh, and domestically. Um, they won't lie down, but. Uh, yeah, Ireland shouldn't have too many issues. Surely, once when if, if if they stand up and fight as they as they can and and, pr- and presumably will, they should get past them. That's Munster, mate. You, you Nick Munster. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's not that's not Ireland. <laughs> you can't you can't just take stand up and fight. I mean, come on, it's Munster's deal. Yeah. And ask Gatland. I asked so Gatland at the launch about whether this was sort of a tougher hand to be dealt with in terms of starting as coach compared to 2008 and, and he joked that in 2008 after that t- 2007 World Cup exit against Fiji that actually 2008 was quite easy because all he did was just pick the Ospreys and just chuck them all in well I mean he could do the same now because the way the Ospreys have been playing over the last few weeks as Charles has just said they, they've been excellent I mean, I mean I think there is there is sort of growing optimism about how those how those teams are performing in the, in the URC and in the Champions Cup I think Ken Owens as captain is a, is a fantastic choice He's still so important to them in terms of getting a lineup functioning, and uh, I think even though it's a real shame that Dowie Lake's injured, actually the young hooker because he's shown flashes of promise, and he's he's not going to be available for for a bit of time. But having Ken Allen as captain, there's there's just some good players there for Wales. Like I keep thinking about Jack Morgan and Tommy Rafael and Chris Chinzer and, and young David Jenkins from Exeter. Like there's, there's so many so much talent. I just wonder if the Ireland game might be too soon and I just don't know if they'll get parity at the set piece even if they've got Wynn James and Thomas Francis and Ken Owens in that front row. I think that might be the area where it goes. But but this this Wales side are not a lost cause. I think that is that is really worth stressing and, and if they don't win this game, don't be surprised if they turn over someone in the Six Nations and cause a bit of a surprise. Um, from, from an Irish perspective, that we talked about how they're afraid it's, it's Johnny Sexton's I'm assuming it's Johnny Sexton's last six nations is it, it? Is. At, the age, at the age of 37 we still haven't quite worked out who his best backup is have we so so is Sexton therefore probably the most important player to any team in this championship do you think great yeah question. I think I think that's a I think that's a fair shout I think that would be a fair shout certainly I mean Andy Farrell seems to have decided who the who the understudy is because he's left out Joey Carberry obviously and 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 selected Ross Byrne um but yeah I think that's I think that's fair enough I think the fly halves across the board um are immensely strong in the Six Nations I, I can't think of many other eras throughout professional rugby whereby 
the Northern Hemisphere teams have had such a strong selection of fly halves in comparison to the Southern Hemisphere teams. Um, and actually, I think that the fly halves, perhaps England aside, who have got, because England have got three really good ones, or four really good ones, really, when you class George Ford coming back. Um, I think the fly halves, are, you look at Paolo Garbisi at Italy, you look at Antimac, Jalibert at France, Russell for Scotland, Sexton for Ireland. The fly halves across the board are probably the most important players in the entire tournament, but certainly Sexton at Ireland, definitely. I mean, we saw him dropping out at short notice against Australia in the autumn, and then they, they limped across the line with Ross Byrne at 10. I know it was, you know, he's inexperienced and he needs that experience, but even so, you feel they would have won much more comfortably if Sexton had started that game. I can see him doing Tom Brady, you know. I can see I can see him retiring and then unretiring. Because um, <laughs> because he got asked that didn't he in, in at the launch and somebody said, "Well, how are you feeling ahead of your your final six nations?" And it, it was like he genuinely not thought about it. Um, and I just think it will depend if he's operating at a high level at the World Cup. And um, do you know what's, what? I was thinking about this earlier. I'm more more confident in Ireland's chances of winning the Six Nations than I am of doing well in the World Cup, just because of the amount of times that Sexton will have to back up in the, in that World Cup is just more and against um potentially against more difficult sides more often um because obviously they're in that they're in that group with the South Africa and Scotland aren't they and then they've got the yeah. the court final against France uh, France or uh New Zealand and they're in the difficult side of the draw um but no I, I, and that's such a good question most valuable player because you kn- DuPont springs to mind and even with those phenomenal scrum halves that um France have got coming through beneath him I still think the kind of when you don't have him that star quality that threat around the fringes that threat from everywhere in the backfield is is just a little bit different that kicking game that he brings and sort of underpins everything in the, the way they the way that France play um one of the questions actually was is this is this the is this the six nations that England finally move on from money to laggy and I think that's Maybe going to happen, isn't it? He's no longer as valuable Certainly with all, the cars. Of those, all, the, all those twelves there. But what, I think what France. Question? I think France would fare better without Antoine Dupont than Ireland would without Johnny Sexton, and I think that's the that's yeah. maybe the crux. But but that's not to say that that, that Sexton is a better player than Dupont. But of, as you just touched on, I think Nolan Le Garec, the 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 French deputy, mm, is, is a phenomenal talent. And if he was to step in for France at scrum half, there would be a drop. Of course there would, because Dupont's the best player in the world. But it's not as much of a drop as as, as Sexton dropping out. And also, what a, what a massive year it is for Sexton. And I agree with you, Charlie, in that he's the, one of the reasons why Ireland are more likely to win the Six Nations than than the World Cup is is because Sexton is, you know, he's he's coming in. The, the Six Nations is basically the start of his year. And uh, okay, he has to back up a lot in the World Cup against quality opposition, but he's got to get there first. You've got all of this Six Nations to get through. He's then got presumably quite a long knockout stage with Leinster as they're going to go far. He's got URC knockouts, and that's before you even get to the summer. You know, that's a lot of really high class rugby for a 37 year old man to be playing before then getting to the biggest stage of the year of the of the of the four years. Let's talk about Italy and France just to wrap up this opening weekend. Loads of interest in Italy after what they did last year. That those just brilliant scenes with that win over Wales and Cardiff, and I think it was Garbisi in tears at the end, and everybody getting aboard the Angie Capuazzo Express as he started scoring wonder tries left, right, and centre. I, I think there's a lot to like because of Capuazzo, but also just other players who I know that from our WhatsApp chat between each other we just really like guys like <laughs> Fischetti guys like Brex in, in the centre as well he's really good Lamaro the captain as well Maurice is in the centres as well yeah yeah him as well so are we quite excited for a bit of Italy King Fischetti yeah absolutely King Fischetti <laughs> possibly yeah vibes over um, vibes over substance at the moment but that might change <laughs> Um, I'm not really, really, really looking, looking forward to this podcast, really. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to the, if we're watching it. Kieran Crowley was so charming at the, the, the launch. He said he was talking about how Italy have to play something, play a bit differently, you know, to um, throw teams off a little bit potentially and, and surprise them. Um, and he said that he was potentially more um, more pre- predisposed to be able to do that with his team because he's a little bit older and 
maybe not that worried about job security, which I just thought was the, cool, <laughs> the coolest thing I've ever heard. The coolest thing I've ever That's heard awesome. at launch. It was, it was really fun. They, they'll miss uh, Garbisi, won't they, until I think at least round three. And um, mm-hmm. he's been playing 12 a lot for Montpellier as, um, with, Car- with Carbonell, I think, yeah. as, uh, as Crowley was saying. Um, Tommy Allen's been pretty decent for, for Quinns um, and has got a fair bit of game time, obviously, because of Marcus Smith's injury. So, Interesting how that goes, and Manancello is one to another one to watch. They've got this, and L- Lamaro, obviously the captain's only twenty four or twenty five as well. And he said that he said too that you know, look, I'm I'm learning on the job, but eventually we're going to see the fruits of those kind of those age grade successes that they have had. And I think that just goes a long way, doesn't it? Just just actually wanting to turn it on and and watch them um, because that some of the tries they scored, it was Samoa, wasn't they? It, it wasn't wasn't it in the um, in the uh, in yeah. the autumn, hammered them. You know, yeah, running running exits from their own twenty two, you know, slicing them up. Um, really nice ball movement, and obviously Capuazzo as a star. His try against South Africa was fantastic. But yeah, vi- vibes to look forward to. Yeah, Charles, just quickly uh, on France, uh, do you think is there any risk with that unbeaten year that they have peaked too early for the World Cup, or do you think they're just tr- they're, they're just gut bobbing along? And everything's going to be sweet. I, I sort of think it's the latter because actually they didn't play that well in the autumn, and yet they still won. So are we sort of feeling that they're they're still on track? Yeah, I think they're still on track. I don't think they've peaked too soon. I don't think they will win this Six Nations. I think that's. I think, I think we're. Is that actually a good thing? Because it sort of takes the pressure off a tiny bit of the World Cup if they perhaps. They and I don't think happen. I don't. You know, I don't think when you have to go away to Dublin and away to Twickenham, I don't think not winning the Six Nations is going to look as the as sort of the biggest disaster that has ever struck a side in the world. Uh, they, uh, it's interesting. Reading Lauren Labie, who's the attack coach over the past few weeks, he's been saying that in the autumn they didn't use the ball perhaps as much as they wanted to. They didn't do as much with the ball as, as they as they perhaps would have liked to. Um, and so perhaps we're going to see sort of after... You know, a, a quite conservative attacking showing in in the autumn. Potentially, we're going to see them chucking it about a little bit more. I think it could be the end of the uh, their French equivalent of the Smith Farrell experiment when they were debating unto Mac Jalibert as a, as a sort of ten twelve uh, combination. I think that might go in the bin. Uh, I know obviously Dante's injured for a, a portion of the Six Nations, but I think that might go in the bin and they're going to hang their hat, presumably on Untermack, but it, it, they could throw a spanner in the works and pick Jalibert at 10. Uh, presumably on Untermack and pick two out-and-out centres as they have been doing at 12 and 13. And Gael Fiku could move back from the wing into the centres and they might sort of um, chuck it about a bit. They've certainly got the players to. They've got an incredible amount of depth and talent there. Okay, just to wrap up, it's been a really, it's sort of intense couple of weeks actually with this topic about the lowering of the tackle height to the waist and, and how that's sort of been rolled out by the Rugby Football Union. Charlie and Charles, you've both been across the story brilliantly over the past few days, so I'm sort of going to defer to the two of you. In, in terms of where we are at the moment, what's sort of the latest situation and what do you think is going to happen next with this this law going through whenever it's going to go through, I think July 1st, is it going to happen? Try first, yeah. I think it's going to happen. I think it's full. Well, I think it's full steam ahead, despite how it's being ro- rolled out. Um, if we have a, if we have a little bit of a really brief timeline, so in December, um, we actually broke the story at the Telegraph that it was kind of going to happen. Um, and I think because that was the uh, other side of Christmas, it maybe didn't either cause a stir, or when it did, when it was announced um, a month later, um, that it, it would. Oh, and 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 how and how it was announced, I think. It, there was um, consternation, a lot of backlash among the community game. Um, amateur players um, furious that they haven't been um, consulted, coaches too. And I have to say that when we broke the story in December, there, were the, there was the same confusion. So it does feel like it has been rushed. And that is how the RFU, that's what the RFU has have apologized, have, have apologized for in what was a remarkable statement. Um, last week it's sort of almost happening backwards um in that we are now we have now been promised a little bit more clarity about that and slowly um we are getting better exp- explanations on the data behind it um it's been a it's been a communications um 
nightmare just for disaster i would say just i would say just if you if you're putting yourselves in the in the shoes of these players that are the the fear that they're going to be playing that the game that they love is going to be totally transformed beyond recognition and then it's now just it was a chance maybe to get on the front foot about it you know steve borthwick and, and kevin sinfield are having to go on the record and say look at this change isn't going to change the fabric of our game hopefully this had to be the message that was drummed home primarily and it just wasn't um one thing that's confusing me about it still um despite having watched you know excellent kind of explanations from the likes of ross tucker and things like that is is a couple of things one i think it's going to be the naval height um despite it being despite one of the problems with the communication being that it was the waist height um, and worries about hips and things like that um, I still think that's a little bit too low. I think the sternum would give you a little bit of wiggle room, although I can also see the benefit of just having a vague area if you're going to um, referee it kind of sympathetically, and that's a key point. The referees need to be on board with this. Um, another thing is that the French trial um, is being kind of cited as a real uh, parallel and a real inspiration for how, why, in the, why is this is being rolled out in England, but there are a few kind of quite a couple of really big check big differences in how it was rolled out in France. First of all, um, French rugby had the focal point, if you can call it that, of four deaths in the community game within a year between 2018 and 2019. English rugby hasn't had that, so maybe it's been more difficult to relate and to see this as a as a definite um, resolution. And the other thing, the other really important thing, it was I think, Charles, you feel strongly about, is that this is coming in in the men's game from the third tier of community rugby the third tier of sorry the third tier of rugby so at national one um whereas in france this was federal trois which is the sixth tier um which is which is which is you know a lot lower and a lot and where you would get a real distinction between grassroots rugby and um and professional and because where it's coming in is is a semi-professional sort of gray area and that is potentially going to be more difficult to drive drive change it yeah, I mean, if you're applying this 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 law into the national level three in English rugby, so national one below, then national one as a standard is closer to the premiership than it is to level nine. You know, and the RFU are in, which is level nine being the sort of lowest rank of men's community rugby in England. Um and the RFU are in a real muddle with this. It's been, it's been how ironic that they've employed a, a head coach of the of the national team who is famed for bringing clarity um, to his messaging when there has been absolutely none of that whatsoever from the RFU with regard to this this new tackle height. And Ollie Brown writing in the writing in the Telegraph, our chief sports writer, summed it up uh, as well as anyone can when he was saying, you know, how how you know how fitting it is that the RFU. Um, have, have have muddled the difference between waist and stern and when it can't tell its posterior from its elbow um which was just a great line and completely true it, it, we've been we've been sort of pulling our hair out over the past few weeks and it, it, it is such a drastic swinging change that is going to it's you've got a generation of rugby players here who are being asked to change overnight um and i feel like the rfu again in conflating national one standard with level seven eight and nine uh, you know they're, they're grouping them all together and that's where they've lost all the nuance here national one has the coaching and the commitment of the players whereby this might work okay there are problems with players on loan and players playing up re relegated and promotional teams so there's even that issue to to to, to, to getting to get involved in but fundamentally it might work at that level but it, for level seven eight and nine these are guys who train once a week at best they turn up on saturday to play with their mates um for, for the social aspect as much as the exercise and as much for a love of the game they are not going to have the time nor frankly the inclination to completely change the habit of the way that they've been playing the game for the past 15 years what might have been more sensible would be to introduce this at sort of under 17s and below to have a full generational switch with the current youth players. So from the, when they first start playing contact rugby to under 17s, to have a generational switch of have 
of have the sternum or the navel as the as the tackle height as the legal tackle height and then slowly filter that upwards into men's rugby into under 18s rugby as this new generation of youth rugby players get older that would surely have been a far less drastic in terms of if if you fine you want to reduce the tackle height they have to do something yes of course we all know they have to do something but this is chaos at the minute it has been chaos and it's going to be chaos and so there's a balance on one side they've you've got the necessity of doing something and on the other side they've got this sort of desire well not desire this need to avoid chaos and they haven't done that there is surely a middle ground whereby they can make the requisite changes that they need to while not alienating a massive proportion of their playing base and that it just seems like it hasn't been fought through. The PowerPoint that we've seen that was the evidential PowerPoint that was presented to council members after which the council members were asked to vote is I'm, I'm not saying that the results and the evidence that is in it are, are spurious, but there is not enough information in that for such a drastic, uh, you know, definitive decision to be made off the back of it for such a, a game-changing, literally a game-changing decision to be made off the back of it. It required much more thought, much more research, much more investigation, and much more presentation. And and that simply wasn't there. And now it's chaos. I think, you're, yeah, Charles, I think you're spot on there. I think I think whether you agree with it or not, and I think most people will acknowledge the game has to be safer, that the wrong out of it has certainly been botched. It just feels like we have a botched job sort of looking at it from... From the outside, Charles, you you were at London Irish yesterday, and you asked Les Kiss sort of about it and his take, and he's the man who sort of was a bit of a pioneer of, of the choke tackle, which was so popular. It's obviously it was obviously going slightly higher than the waist. Uh, let's hear now what he makes of the RFU's decision. I think for the first thing I'd like to say about the choke tackle, it was never ever a collision tackle. It was an obs- it, it was an absorption tackle. You absorb the pressure, and then you get under the ball. So it was never a high collision. I think most of the collisions are when you can't control speed on speed and shooters out of the line and those things so the you know i understand the choke tackle has you high but it was never a collision tackle it was always an absorption tackle absorb in under the ball everyone gets in twist it change the momentum of that area and then you get a scrum um, and sometimes you don't want to go to scrum because you're not winning your scrums but <laughs> but important to understand that we have to try and manage that height we have to in the, in the rfu and world rugby are trying to look at ways to do that uh, player safety is paramount. That's ab- absolutely certain uh, in terms of m- where I've come from. Uh, I guess we've got to look at the whole process um, that everyone across world rug- uh, ac- across rugby in the world can have consistency about what they're seeing. And I guess the biggest point I'd make on it is that in a game, there's probably four or five that are not looked at. We only focus on the ones that the referee goes to or the TMO looks at. And some of those other four or five are probably not in the data. I'm not sure if they are, but there are incidents that happen. There is head knocks that are accidental, but are they all logged in as part of the data and there's no injury? So I, I, I trust that all the data they've got is exactly what they're saying. There is evidence to prove this. I don't think we're going to stop this. And, and I mean, the smart, a smart organisation you know, rolls with that and, and makes sure you get in front of where the game's going to be in five years. Kiss talking about absorb, the choke tackle and absorbing is really interesting because absorbing is the word that's been used a lot bandied around and when it comes to picking goes. And that's sort of the one thing about this little change, which I think I really need to see in practice to understand. Because if you're going to be introducing a waste tackle law, and picking goes, you're going to be sort of allowed because you're going to be absorbing a tackler. And then that bit really sort of it's been sorry charlie you, you had a point there you yeah had a point. well well just because the championship cup trial which was ended i think at the start of 2019 i believe or the year before i just remember this morning i went to a game i went to the first game of that to just see what it looked like and it looked and it looked very similar to be fair it was between london scottish yeah. and, and richmond but the so a problem area for that was the pick and go because well, there are loads of problems with this trial, one of which was ironically that players were switching between the championship in which there were uh, regular laws and then this armpit or nipple height um, law that came in just for this cup co- co- competition, um, which was then abandoned before the knockout stages. Um, the pick and go was a problem area because it was this area that tacklers were seen to be sort of unnaturally going low against carriers who were stooping because they were close to the line and, and hoping to get over the line. Now, what we know, what we've been told about the pick and go in under these kind of 
um, laws that are coming in is that potentially tacklers will be able to stay upright and soak tackle soak is a term that I've heard in a in a kind of safe manner which you would hope wouldn't necessarily change the kind of fabric of what they've got going on at the minute because actually that's a pretty safe thing to do because the the tackler's head is just in a different height to the to the carrier's head um naturally um but and I can feel Charles desperate to get in here. What this, what this kind of is, is, is bubbling. Is bubbling. But what this, what this brings in is an inconsistency. Is is that the fact that you're refereeing a tackle in differently in a different situation? And again, that comes back to: Do we want this game to be even more convoluted by individual interpretations of referees? Do we? And how do we keep this game easy, not only to play and to watch, but to referee? Exactly. It's already become too convoluted. The laws are already too complex. The laws are already too different at a grassroots level to at a professional level. It's already there's already too much of a of a disparity between the game that you watch on television and the game that you watch at your local pub uh, club on a Saturday. Now, referees are going to be asked to apply a completely different set of laws potentially to a pick and go scenario. Um, and before even th- those laws are applied, you have to define a pick and go. What is a pick and go? If if a nine, if a nine picks up the ball at the back of a rook and dithers a bit, then decides to dart himself, is that a pick and go? Would he have to be chopped? Would he ha- would he be able to be soaked? It, you know, chopping and soaking are things for the kitchen, frankly. This isn't. <laughs> Right, everybody, that is everything for this week. Hope you've enjoyed listening to the podcast and that you're just as excited to start the Six Nations as we are. Um, we are stacked with content on the website today and over the coming days, building up to the uh, the start of the tournament. And we're going to have articles from all three of us, as well as expert analysis from Gavin Mayers, Will Greenwood, Brian Moore, and, and the rest of the team. We'll be back every Monday from now until the end of the tournament. So please hit subscribe. Tell your family and friends what a great time you've had listening to this week's episode and come back next week as we review the opening round of the Six Nations matches. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.